This is the last lecture uh, for the semester. I know there are quite a few that I posted, but I uh, promise this will be the last one. And this focuses on that short excerpt that you have on the um, um, anti-ERA movement of the 1970s. So I, I want to address um, this kind of conservative movement. And, and this example is, is um, um, is about women, uh, because I've been typically throughout the entire semester, we tend to talk about more progressive women because they're the ones who are, you know, kind of tired of living a, a lifestyle that's kind of set upon them, right, by men. So this is a lesson that kind of goes against that, um, but it's still kind of an interesting piece that looks at women in the 1960s and 70s, uh, particularly in the 1970s, that um, actually want to return back to the, as they quote, uh, good old days, right? Uh, even today, when we say "Make America Great Again," there is a, a small, or you know, obviously a big, because they they vote in a particular way, a uh, group of women who say, you know, I want to go back to that era of 1950, you know, seven, you know, 56, where women were lucky enough to stay home and, and have, you know, be housewives and take care of the kids, and maybe you're you're one of them, or maybe your parents are are one of them. And sometimes to us, particularly in, in academia, it sounds kind of weird. Why would any, any woman want to go back to the house, right, to the home and be a housewife? But um, as a historian, we, we have to look at these things kind of critically and try to understand where they're coming from. So <clears throat> in this last lecture, I'm going to address this, what's called the silent majority. And all these examples um, actually come from women. You know, they're, they're not from men, even though the reading that you're going to address in a minute focuses on men addressing about uh, the issue about the Equal Rights Amendment. It's, it's um, this particular lecture focuses on women wanting to go back to the home. So in the 1970s, uh, 70s, you have this movement. Uh, historians have defined it as this kind of new right. Um, it actually starts with your your own congressman here in um, Arizona called Goldwater. You might see his name in Scottsdale. And um, he becomes one of these key figures that defines this new conservative movement of the 1960s and 1970s. <clears throat> now, this study, this is, comes from a study uh, by a historian in, um, at my alma mater, uh, UC Santa Barbara, that looks at conservative women who are challenging some of the changes that are happening in the 1960s. So this is this this stuff is happening in the 1970s where they feel that the America that they once knew is changing. You know, so it's definitely a, a critique of liberalism and the feminist movement. And they kind of justify their logic, their their argument on this idea that women were made for certain reasons and you know there are strict kind of gender differences according to them i'm not saying that there is but according to these women um, there is a, a gender difference between men and women and that god himself created these differences <clears throat> so this study kind of focuses on women who are writing to their congressmen asking them to vote against the equal rights of men and, and that's the kind of puzzling thing. Why would women support uh, them to, to basically kill this Equal Rights Amendment when they're the ones who are going to benefit from it? So that's why for many uh, women and even feminists in particular, it doesn't, didn't make any sense why women would vote against their own interests. Well, there's a few reasons. Remember, these are all letters and a historian looked at a collection of letters and synthesized them and analyzed them and, and, on, found some common threads that kind of bind these these women together. <clears throat> so the um, the Equal Rights Amendment was really riding the wave of the 1960s. You know that that kind of progressive um, liberal uh, movement where you know civil rights was getting passed, right segregation was ending, um, addressing uh, poverty in America, older people were getting health care. So it was riding that wave, and, and many people thought it was going to get passed without much of a problem. And then, and then Utah came <laughs> and kind of put a halt to all that. 
So the, re the, the question is, why, why did it stop? Well, they had a few fears. Number one, uh, again, these women were running to their congressmen, and many of them felt that um, they were worried that the privileges that they had as middle-class women were going to end if the Equal Rights Amendment passed. The belief was that if equal pay goes to both sexes, that means that my husband is going to take a cut on his wage. Therefore, it's going to force me to go to work. And I don't want to go to work. I like being a housewife. I like taking care of my kids. And um, this Equal Rights Amendment is going to do me more harm than good. <clears throat> another kind of crate, uh, sorry, another kind of, uh, um, argument that they made was that um, the Equal Rights Amendment, since they made both sexes equal, then that means that women would have to go into the front lines when if there were a war. And remember that Vietnam is happening around this time. And so they're worried that they're going to have to go to war. And uh, there's this idea that women don't go to war, men go to war. Now, none of this is being proposed in the Equal Rights Amendment. None of this is, is actually written down on this piece of, of legislation. But these were the fears that these women had of what could happen. In their kind of perspective, this is the slippery slope towards something else. <clears throat> Number three, uh, homosexuality, right? <laughs> that um, this, this uh, piece of legislation is going to um, advocate for homosexuality to be okay. Um, I'm not, I can't remember why they, they came up with this conclusion, but I, you know, it, it kind of fits the idea of, of some of these kind of conservative women perspective that, you know, A, it's wrong, and B, the government's going to force us to do these things. Number four, uh, abortion. Uh, again, abortion was a hot topic at this time. Conservatives began to oppose it. And the, there's this belief that abortion was going to be accessible, if not even demanded. Um, on, on, any, on every person. So uh, the legislation had nothing to do with abortion, but in their mind, this was going to be the, the rule of the land. <clears throat> Another major issue, and, and we still see this argument today, in our, our bathrooms. Um, today, uh, if you ever, if you kind of follow the news in the last couple of years, you see the whole kind of transgender issue in bathrooms. Well, that was nothing new, right? Um, in the 1970s, many of these women who are running to their congressmen are afraid that all bathrooms are going to become unisex and that um, men were going to start entering uh, a space that's um, restricted to them, right? And, and, and where women do you know, their business and that they could get attacked. Now, Again, the laws had nothing, we're, we're not talking about this, but this makes it into a political issue, right? And it wasn't just this idea of bathrooms being um, neutral, but that um, black men were going to start entering these bathrooms. And, and America has a long history of stereotyping black men as lustful, uh, you know, and going after, you know, women, white women in particular. So, <clears throat> There's this, again, this, this kind of irrational fear that black men were going, uh, if this law passed, that black men were going to enter women's bathrooms and sexually abuse them, even though you know, none of this was being pr proposed. So, you know, do these women sound crazy? Well, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> there's some truth to it at the very least. Understand that in their mind, their America was changing. You know, they grew up in the 19, you know, 40s, 50s, and early 60s, where America still had segregation. And, you know, in 1954, you have things like Brown versus Board of Education that desegregates these, you know, schools and other laws, you know, Equal Rights Amendment um, um, legislation that begins to kind of promote equality and African Americans moving into white neighborhoods, <clears throat> or at least minorities, you know, moving into white neighborhoods. So this is this, by the 1970s, America doesn't look like anything that they recognized from the 1950s, right? So in their mind, America is, you know, is kind of heading towards this direction. 
And one place that you see it in the 1970s is the, the in school busing. Um, this was in the news not too long ago. Um, but um, <clears throat> what was happening in the 1970s is that they would um, take African-American kids from the inner city and, and bus them into kind of suburban schools so they can get a good education to, you know, desegregate some of these schools. Um, and then they would take Anglo-American kids and, you know, bus them down downtown. And this was supposed to help kind of create, you know, kind of bridge the gap in regards to educational, um, education equality. And in their mind, uh, in these kind of conservative people of mine, uh, the idea was that, well, the government's already, is already kind of forcing us to do certain things that we don't want to do. So what's going to stop them from doing any of these things, right? So what happens to the Equal Rights Amendment, even though none of this stuff is being proposed, um, these women are a vocal group, and that's why they call the silent majority. They're not out there protesting like, you know, liberals in the 1960s and, you know, um, holding up signs and marching down streets. Um, the way they protest is by voting. And that was definitely more effective um, because people went to the polls, voted, and were able to stop the Equal Rights Amendment. It was supposed to pass in the 1970s. It didn't get them, you know, the, the votes that it needed, enough states to ratify it. It got pushed to 82, and by then, boom, it was, it was dead. By then, we have a new era of, you know, the Reagan era, and um, these, this type of legislation just falls apart. All right, so um, I want to stop it there, and this basically kind of ends the class. This is the last lecture I'm going, going to give, and um, I wanted to kind of show you a different perspective on women who, I mean, these are not feminists by any sense of the word, but um, definitely addressing things that they feel are important to them. And it's a real fascinating period if you like um, women's history, uh, because some of these ideas that they come up with sound kooky. Uh, but as a historian, you kind of go, well, where is it all coming from? So uh, we'll end it there, and I hope you enjoy the class for, for what it was. I know we can be uh, couldn't meet face-to-face after spring break but um hope you enjoy the material and uh remember that you're going to have a final take notes on the on the lectures um remember also just don't write down the powerpoints because you know some of the stuff that is said will show up on the exam so you know take good notes and um hopefully you're you'll be ready for the exam have a good summer break